about temptation. And <clears throat> this morning, he's laid a message on my heart this week. Why? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but it's a message that every one of us who have been in church for any length of time has probably heard before. It's a message that we've probably heard more than once. And it's a message that we'll probably continue to hear. I know we will. And it's a message that none of us want to hear. The reason that we don't want to hear it is because <clears throat> it's one of the biggest problems that faces all mankind today. Believers and unbelievers. Those who are trying their best to live for the Lord and are striving to mature daily and for those that are not, it affects us all. It's something that we all have to deal with. And it doesn't matter if you're one of those people who deals with the public all the time if you deal with it in your job, at school, wherever, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're just at home as a couple. It doesn't matter. It's something that affects every one of us. No matter how many people you're involved with, it still affects us. And it's something that we have to deal with that we don't want to. The reason that we don't want to deal with it is because it's hard to deal with. It's tough. It's something that, that just is extremely tough for any of us to do. Because everything that you have to do to fix it goes against human nature. Everything you have to do to live above it goes against even some things that we were taught by our parents. Everything that we have to do to overcome this situation in life is hard. There's nothing easy about it. And you're not exempt just as we talked about last week, none of us are immune from temptation. Absolutely none of us are immune from the problem we're going to talk about today, which is in also back in the book of James, James chapter 3. And once I said that, y'all are like, oh, I saw the look on your face. Because you know where we're going. But I want you to come down to verse number 7. Come down to verse number 7. It says, for every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed or have been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame, for it is an unruly evil full of deadly of poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made in the similitude or similar to God or in the pattern of God. Right? It says, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. And then we go down, and you, we all know how a fountain can't produce sweet water bitter, how a fig tree can't bear olive berries. <clears throat> and we see the whole point. But the point is, is if I, this, this is why it's so tough for us. Because if you're in your house, and even if you have small children, small grandchildren, whatever, if you have children in your house, you put the things that are poison out of reach for those children, right? 
I mean, if you have something that you know is going to kill your child if they drink it, then you usually try to get it up out of their reach so that they don't try to drink it because we all know how younger children are. They're going to try to drink it, touch it, whatever. It's like, don't touch that. It's poison. Don't drink that. It's poison. When we get see pesticides and we see restricted use pesticides and we see where a restricted use pesticide, one of the biggest marks on it, it always has to have a warning sign, but it also has to have a skull and crossbones on it. You know why? Because it means it's a key. If you don't handle that in the proper way, it can kill you. All right? So that's why they put that on there. We all see it. We all know it. We all realize it. Hey, that's dangerous. Don't pick it up. Don't drink it. Don't eat it. Don't even touch it if you don't have to. Right? We know how to deal with poison. It's poison. It'll kill you. Don't do it. But yet when it comes to our tongue, we ignore it. We ignore the situations that we are in, although we are told by God himself that the tongue no man can tame. Now that doesn't mean that there's not a spiritual cure, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. There is a spiritual cure, but alone you cannot conquer the tongue because it is an unruly or <clears throat> some versions uh, use the word restless. It is a restless thing. It's an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. That's the way God describes your tongue. An unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Why? And he tells us why. He said, because blessings and cursings come out of the same mouth. And he said, this should not be. Why does this happen? Because we tend to give in to human nature. And I said earlier, I said, even our parents have taught us things that we go against when it comes to this. Because even our parents at times teach us, hey, there's point in times when you have to stand up for yourself, right? And you say, well, that's not bad advice. No, it's not. There's times when you are standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ and you have to stand up for yourself and you have to be a voice. But it's how you use your tongue. It's the words that go across it that make it evil and poisonous. You see, there's an uncontrollable character that is in our tongue that makes a complete mockery out of people who think they are wise or who think they have all this discipline or self-control. It's something that you can't control because you can't help it because you let human nature direct you instead of spiritual nature. And who in this room is guilty? Every one of us. You can't tell me there hasn't been a point in time in your life when you haven't run off at the mouth when you know you shouldn't. When you said things you wished you could take back. My brother made a comment this week and he didn't even know I was going to preach this message, but he helped me a little bit. But, but he, he made a comment this week. He said, words are the one thing that you can't ever take back. And it's like, that's so true. Because once they come out, you can't take them back. You can't change what you said. So what does God show us here? He shows us in his scripture that this is truly the revealing nature of the tongue. What is the revealing nature of the tongue? It doesn't matter if you're building people up, which you can do, which is a good use of the tongue, or if you're tearing people down, which is a bad use of the tongue. What it really reveals it's not how much wisdom you have, how much self-control you have. It's not about being disciplined or strong. What it reveals is the true nature of your heart. 
That's what the tongue truly reveals. We all know how upset Jesus Christ was in Revelation 3 when he talked about the Laodicean church. And I can't get this out of my mind. It's been in there lately. And because everywhere I look, it makes me want to throw up. And so I can't imagine that Jesus Christ is not nauseated sitting at the right hand of God continually. We all know what it feels like to be nauseated. What it is to be sick to your stomach. How that you just wish you could throw up and get rid of it. How that you just wish that feeling would go away. But every time I look around me in this world, it makes me want to throw up at what this world has become. At who we are. So we don't think that Jesus Christ is not sitting at the right hand of God ready to throw up at what he said. Because he says, out of the same mouth should not come blessings and cursings. We shouldn't be hypocrites. Amen. And when we lose control of our tongue, it makes us a hypocritical person. I'm not saying you're a full-blown hypocrite because you get angry, say something you shouldn't. Right? That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, is it a hypocritical action? Absolutely. It goes against God. That's why we don't like to hear this message. You know why? Because it hits home. It hits deep within ourselves. It hits within our hearts because none of us are immune. I don't care how old you are how young you are. None of us are immune to having the problem with the tongue. And it's a problem we have to overcome. People go around and they talk about others. They go around and they'll gossip or, <coughs> or they just simply get mad and go off on somebody. <clears throat> For whatever reason. And then they say words that you can never take back. And for the person that you just use that poison on and and those words that come out of your mouth are no less hurtful or no less poison than decon you give a rat it cuts them it hurts them it's words they never forget and when we get hurt what's the, what's usually the first thing we do when we get hurt feeling some people say, well, I curl up and cry. No, our first reaction is to lash back. That's human nature. Your human nature is that you lash back. You know, somebody walks up to you and says you're stupid. Your first reaction is, well, you're dumber than I am. You know, we lash back. Because it's like, you're not just going to hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to make things worse for you. You're not just going to tear me down. I'll tear you down with me. I'm not going down by myself. You're going down with me. That's our human nature. It's natural for us to do that. We do it without even thinking. We do it because it's so natural to us that that's our reaction. That's why we make a mockery out of people who say, yeah, I, I love the Lord. I try to do everything for the Lord. And then you see them yelling at their neighbor across a fence. And I'm not saying they ain't neighbors that you can do because they neighbors you'd like to just choke, you know? I mean, you just like to choke a life out of them because it's like, listen. <clears throat> or people that we have conflicts with. I'm not telling you that you have to like everybody. And I'm not telling you that being a pacifist is the way that God intended for people to be because that goes against Scripture. God didn't intend for his children to be pacifists who sit back and take everything and take everything and take everything and never give it out. What I'm talking about is God gives us explicit instructions on how to speak. What to speak. How to use your speech. And it's not by just sitting back and taking abuse but it's by using the words that God intends for us to use, not the poison that you can't take back. 
that causes more hurt. <clears throat> Think about how many churches have been split up because of words. True. Somebody said this about this one or somebody said that about that one and then somebody else believed it and before you know it, it's running rampant and you got this side against this side and then all of a sudden the church is split and all we know is something that started with a few words. Most of it not ever true, just words. Think about how many times in, in your own church life, right? In your own church life, think about how many times people have said things to you, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, who have said things to you or about you that have hurt you. You say, why are you bringing all them emotions back? Now I'm just going to go home feeling bad. Because we all have them. Every one of us have those feelings where somebody has said something that has hurt us or made us angry or that has caused us to even question our salvation at times because we realize how much we just want to kill them. Why? Because it's human nature. That's what the tongue truly reveals about a person. This is why we don't like to think about it, because it reveals the true nature of our heart. It reveals the true nature of our character, who we really are. You say, well, I just lost my cool for a minute, and, and so the things I said I'm not responsible for because I, 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 I lost my temper you're still responsible according to God's word. You're still responsible. You're better than that. You should have never gone down that road. You should have never taken that route. You see, that's why it hurts. Because we know what God says. That's why we don't want to hear this message. We don't want to hear because we know that we're guilty. We don't like to be reminded of our weakness. And the tongue is a weakness for everyone. The tongue is a weakness for every believer and unbeliever in this world. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. It has poisoned relationships. It has poisoned businesses. It has poisoned things in life <clears throat> that we can't imagine that have simply been poisoned by the tongue. Just words. Just words. But yet those words have a long-lasting effect. And once we think about that, and we keep reminding ourselves of that, let me remind you of this. There is a spiritual cure. And like any other cure, like any other addiction in life, whatever it may be, you know, you go, you see AA or, or drug addicts or what, what's the first thing that all psychologists or people who try to talk to them, what is the first thing that they have to do? They have to admit they're addicted. They have to admit that there's a problem. There's never going to become a solution until you admit there's a problem that needs to be fixed. Right? <clears throat> so that's the first thing. And even over there in James chapter 1, verse 26, you can turn and look at it if you want to, but the overall point is, here's what God said. He says, a man who doesn't know how to bridle his tongue, he said his whole religion, his whole belief is in vain. You know what that means? It means if you don't bridle your tongue, then it makes everything around you, your, your religious beliefs, and I hate the word religion because it covers a lot of things, but the things you believe, it makes them worthless. Do you know that you can go talk to somebody 
for three weeks about the Lord Jesus Christ and they can think you're one of the greatest people in the world and how you've been this fantastic witness to them and then they do something that makes you mad and you say three words in anger or three ugly words to these people or whatever it may be. One small conversation that doesn't last 30 seconds. And do you know you can ruin your entire testimony? Everything that you have built with that person can be destroyed like that. That's why at the beginning of this verse, it says that the tongue is like a fire, an uncontrollable fire that runs rampant. We all see the damage that a fire does. Once a fire comes and goes, once the words are said and done, what do you still have? You still have destruction. The destruction doesn't come back overnight. All the things that that fire destroyed are still burned up in ash, laying there. It's still being destroyed. And that's what God compares the tongue to. A raging fire that is running wild that you cannot control that just destroys everything in its path. So <clears throat> he says, if if you don't want your testimony to be worthless, then you have to admit that you have the problem. We have to admit that we have a problem. We are the problem. We control the words that come out of our mouth. Do you know Isaiah Isaiah chapter 6 and what is it, verse 5, I think, somewhere right in that area. Verse 8 is where he says, here am I, Lord, send me. But before then, when God comes to him and wants him to go to Israel, what does Isaiah, what does Isaiah say to him? You know, we, we all preach the message, which I do too. I'm guilty of this same thing. I, I always say, what did Isaiah say? Here am I, Lord, send me. We don't realize what he said in verse 5. When God told him he needed somebody to go for him, he said, I can't go. We don't remember that part, right? It's like, what? He said, I can't go. Yeah. He said, Lord, I can't go. I'm undone. He said, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in a nation. He was talking about the nation of Israel, and he said, I live in a nation that is full of unclean lips. He said, I can't go. I can't be a voice because they don't trust me. Because I'm a person with unclean lips. Living in a people with unclean lips. Then after that, it says that an angel comes down, and this is a signification. An angel comes down, takes a coal, a hot burning coal off of the altar in heaven, comes down, places it in Isaiah's mouth and said, now I have cleansed your mouth. And then he says, now, whom shall I send and who will go for me? And then Isaiah said, here am I, send me. You see, <clears throat> he admitted right off that he had a problem. He admitted that there was a problem that needed to be fixed. And before we can ever start the spiritual healing, we have to admit there's a problem. We have to focus on the heart because remember, what does the tongue truly reveal? It reveals the nature of the heart. Go with me because I want you to look at this scripture. I don't know if I can just stop at one here, one verse, but I'm going to try. Uh, come with me to Matthew. Matthew chapter number 12, and we're dealing with Jesus Christ talking himself. Matthew 12, come all the way down to verse number 34. Matthew 12, 34. Now, I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, and I want you to look at this verse. Now, this group of verses, because I want you to see. <clears throat> now, what does he start out as? He says, O generation of vipers. He says, How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of of the heart, the mouth speaketh. 
Out of the abundance of the heart, what is in the heart, you see the same thing that James is telling us, the revealing of the heart is what the tongue does. But I want us to keep reading here, but I want you to notice that part. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good fruit. An evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, Jesus said, that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words they shall be justified, and by their words shall they be condemned. Now, it's not by your words that you're going to be saved or not. What he was talking about, what is Jesus Christ talking about? What was being produced? Things that were good, things that were profitable, things that were fruitful. That was what was being produced. Fruit for the Lord or evil. Everything that is against God. That's all evil represents. Everything that is against God. <clears throat> I tell my grandchildren all the time, they always start with, is this right or is this right or should I do this or should I listen to that or should I do this? And I said, the Bible is very plain. For those that know to do right and they don't do it, to them it is sin. I don't know how many times I've quoted that verse to my grandchildren. It's pretty simple. All right? If you know to do what's right and you don't do it, then you're against God because that's sin. And every sin is against God. What is the mouth? The mouth is the true revealing of the heart. What are you bringing forth? <clears throat> what words come out of your mouth? Because Jesus Christ said every idle word that you speak. Even when you don't think it's important, it's important. And so he said, your mouth reveals your true heart. That's what it does. <clears throat> so you have to focus on your heart. Once you know you have a problem, then you have to focus on fixing the heart by doing what you know is right. It's not hard. The spiritual cure is easy. It's like taking a pill. Right? You go to the doctor and they say, oh, you've got this problem, this problem, this problem, and all the other problems. But all you got to do is take this one pill and it'll solve all your problems. Jesus Christ has given us his word to solve our problems. And he said, the mouth is a terrible problem. One of the worst problems that we have because it's poison, it's wicked, it's evil. It is a destructing wildfire that you cannot control. So you have to depend on the spiritual cure. You have to focus on that. You have to ask God for help. Do you remember Psalm 51? Remember what I told you? That was David after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. And he'd lost his firstborn son with her. Do you remember that? And he locks himself in a dark room because Nathan comes by and tells him about all this stuff. And he said, you tell me who did that and I'll have him killed. And he said, it was you. And Nathan told him he was going to lose his son and he lost his son. And he was in great mourning and he was locked up in a dark room and, and he wrote Psalm 51. And in verse 10, what does he say? Create in me a new heart. Create in me a new spirit. Make me different. You see, we have to learn to depend on God. And to ask God for help. Because no man can tame the tongue. But he already has it. So he can help you. By creating in you. A new heart. And a new spirit. A new attitude. A new life. We learn in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Behold all things. All, <clears throat> all things that are old are passed away. Behold all things become new. We know that for sure. 
All right? Those old things are gone. We need him to create in us a new mindset. We need our heart to be fixed. We need to let our heart be the one that is controlling our mouth because it is focused on serving Christ. Because he has created within us a new attitude. You don't think that Jesus Christ can't fix your attitude? People say all the time, this is the way I am. This is just who I am. This is just what he wants me to be. That's not true. You know, <clears throat> I was reading a book um, that uh, was written. I can't remember who the writer was. If I would, I'd tell you and I'd give him credit, but I don't remember. But he wrote a book about John Wesley, the preacher, uh, who actually was the founder of the Methodist Church or whatever, but it doesn't matter. But he was writing about some of the sermons of John Wesley. And he said that he was with him actually at a revival in a town. And he said there was a young lady who walked up to John Wesley and she said, she said, Pastor Wesley, she said, I have <clears throat> learned what my talent is. He said, really, what is it? She said, my talent is to speak my mind. And he said that John Wesley never hesitated. And he said, well, ma'am, he said, I think that's one talent that the Lord wouldn't care if you buried it. Surely you get that. That's funny. Mm -hmm. right? Y'all got no sense of humor. <laughs> because it truly is a talent that needs to be buried. Speaking your mind is not a talent. Okay? It's not something that is good. That's the problem we have. You see, that's why... Y'all ain't got no sense of humor because we think that is a good thing. It's not a good thing. It's not a good thing to say, oh, I speak my mind. Oh, I'm strong. I stand up for myself. I do all these things. I am so strong in myself. I am so confident in myself. Yada, yada, yada. You can build up yourself all you want to, but all you're doing is showing how little you truly are. That's right. You see, <clears throat> because it's not about speaking your mind that makes a difference. It's about speaking with the mind of Christ guiding you that makes a difference. Amen. So <clears throat> that's why it was so important that she bury that talent. It was not good. So we have to ask God for that help to create in us a new heart, a new spirit, a new way that fixes our mind to where we don't want to spout off at the mouth anymore, that our spiritual nature takes over. How do we do this? It's pretty simple. Talk less. James is real adamant about talking less. You remember him, James 1, verse 19? This is a verse that all of us should have, that we should have memorized and we should keep in our mind. I try to keep it in my mind lots of times because we all have a tendency to spout off, and I'm no different. I do too, but <laughs> I try to remember this verse constantly. What does he say? Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. We forget the first part. We are very fast to speak, and we're very fast to wrath, and we never really listen. But you're not ever going to learn from God you're not ever going to apply scripture if you don't listen. How can you be obedient if you don't know what God is saying? We learn that from his word. We learn that by listening to what he says, by applying what he's taught us. So if you want to control your mouth, talk less. Who cares what the people say about us? Who cares if people really like us or not? Now, as far as our testimony is concerned, we want people to listen to us. We want people to care about us. We want people to have confidence in us so that they can listen to the testimony. But if you testify to them one minute and cuss them the next or cuss somebody else the next, you've just lost it all. It's gone. Learn to talk less. What does God promote? God promotes positive speech, right? Go to Colossians chapter 4. I'm about done, I promise. 
Colossians chapter number four. And come down to verse six. Colossians four, verse six. He says, let your speech be always with grace. You know what that is? Undeserved kindness. Always be kind to others. Seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Seasoned with salt. What the world does that mean? People say, oh, that means take the bitterness out of your speech. That is true. Salt does take the bitterness out, and you need to take the bitterness out of your speech. All right? You need to have grace in it, absolutely. But that's not what he's talking about at this particular point with seasoned with salt. What was Paul making a reference to? Make it taste better. Make it easy to swallow. Make it as sweet as honey. Okay? That's the whole point. It needs to taste better. It needs to taste better when you're speaking because you know that what you're saying is the truth. But it needs to be tasty to those that you are talking to because you need to be positive and reinforcing and you need to be helpful to them in whatever form it is. Not just about being a witness, but helping those that are in need. Giving advice to your family. Helping those that are struggling. Let your speech reflect Jesus Christ. Another good place to go is go back a couple of books to Ephesians. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. I'm trying to find a verse I want because I'll... I didn't plan on using this verse. 29. 29. Come down toward the end of the chapter. Ephesians 4, 29. Let not corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good unto the edifying, that it... <clears throat> that it might minister grace unto the hearers. Don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth. You know what that is? Anything that's not wholesome, anything that is not good, anything that is not productive. Huh? Corrupt communication. We know what it is to be corrupt. Corrupt is rotten. And if you go on down in there, it goes on down in the last verse and talks about what? Bitterness, malice, wrath, guile. <clears throat> You've got to get rid of the rotten conversations. The things that are intended to hurt and destroy. And we have to focus on the things that are right and true. That's what God intends for us to do. Now, <clears throat> you asked yourself the question, what kind of mouth do I have? Do I have a mouth that the Lord would be happy with or do I have a mouth that the Lord says is full of poison, full of corruptness, full of evil? Does my tongue truly reveal the true character of who I am? Or am I reflecting Jesus Christ in my life? Like I said, this is a message that none of us want to hear because we all have some form of guilt when it comes to our tongue. Some more than others. Some in different areas than others. But the one thing we're reminded is that our tongue is always poison. And we have to be able to set that aside, grow in God, follow the cure that God set forth to us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, God, asking you to 
reveal our true nature today. Lord, whether we are following human nature or whether we are following the new spiritual nature that you've placed within us, Lord, we know that our mouth reveals a lot to us in that fact, and we pray, God, that you would help us because we know we don't have the power, but we pray for your power today to control our tongue. Help us, Lord, to have the speech that you would have us to be, follow the commands that you would follow us, have us to follow, to do the things that are necessary in your service that we could always learn to have the mind of Christ, to imitate Christ, Father, to the point that we could always share the truth, share the love, share the hope, share the peace. God, let us have these things, and we'll grant you all the glory because we know it all comes from your power, your strength, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Anybody got a word, testimony, anything on your heart?